Way back when I was a wee young teenager and I first became enamored with 90s Macs, which granted wasn't really that far off from when those Macs were new. There was one mythical machine that I was obsessed with. And I don't mean that it was hard to find. It's mythical because it doesn't exist, at least not officially. It's the unreleased Macintosh Color Classic 3, the most powerful compact Mac ever developed and better known by its internal Apple code name, Mystic. Even though it was canceled during development, we can actually build one using parts from other machines and a few hardware hacks. So today, let's explore one of the best, worst computers that Apple ever made, the original Color Classic. We'll fix it up, find out why people were so desperate to upgrade it, and then let's talk about turning it into the ultimate Macintosh Mystic. So stay tuned. And if you enjoy the ritual sacrifice of multiple classic Macs in the quest to build one mega Mac, actually no Macs were harmed during the filming of this video, at least not permanently. I hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel. The project that we're about to embark on building a mystic is something that's really special to me. When I say that I've been obsessed with building one for years, I really mean it. One of the machines we'll be using, sacrificing, I picked up for this very purpose more than 15 years ago. And even though I've now had all the parts to hopefully build a working Mystic for a few months now, I wanted to wait until March to start it. Because March is Marchintosh, where lots of creators switch up their content to focus on vintage Mac stuff. And since we already do a ton of vintage Mac stuff here, I wanted to save this really special project for this really special annual event. I'll link to some more Marchintosh info in the description below because there's a lot of cool stuff going on this month and it's a lot of fun to keep up with. So to build the fabled Color Classic 3 Mystic, we need to start with a Color Classic. Now, this was back in the days of Apple naming things all willy-nilly, so you might have seen the Color Classic released as the Performa 250. And I've been looking for a nice one for ages. I finally found one, fairly locally no less, in pretty great condition about 90 minutes from my house. Now, the Color Classic is a really interesting machine and kind of a polarizing one too, even when it was new. EveryMac.com starts out this specs page by calling it the much loved Apple Macintosh Color Classic but then immediately goes into the specs, which are the reason it's not really all that loved. On the bright side, it has a beautiful, crisp 10 inch Sony Trinitron RGB display. On the bad side, well, everything else about it. Released in 1993 for $1,400, the Color Classic was saddled with a pokey 16 megahertz 68030 processor and hamstrung by a glacially slow 16 megahertz bus. It shipped with a laughable four megs of RAM and it was hard limited to 10 megs of RAM. It had 40, 80 or 160 megabyte hard drive options along with a single 1.44 megabyte floppy drive. To put that into perspective, 1989's Macintosh SE30 also had a 16 megahertz 6830 on a 16 megahertz bus. Though with the right ROM, that thing can handle a whopping 128 megs of RAM. Oh, and this beautiful color screen, it was absolutely wasted on its 512 by 384 resolution. Too small to run many common applications of the time. Seriously, most software was designed for 640 by 480. So at best, your applications would be cut off on the bottom or the right side of the screen. And at worst, those games you wanted to play on this lovely Trinitron would just fail to load altogether. Basically, the Color Classic was the beautiful color compact Mac that everyone had dreamed about, just hobbled by Apple in every conceivable way. Now, if you were in Canada or Japan, you were lucky enough to get the Color Classic 2, only released in those two markets and really made iterative improvements over this first model. The processor speed was doubled and it could handle up to 36 megs of RAM, although it's not really like they tried that hard. Apple literally just took the motherboard straight out of the LC550 
and shoved it into this machine where it was pin compatible and called it the Color Classic 2. In fact, you can still take the motherboard straight from an LC550, shove it in the back of this thing, and it'll be a Color Classic 2. It'll just work. Even the ports in the back are exactly the same. Anyway, Apple really intended to right the shortcomings of the Color Classic line with the Color Classic 3. With a fast 33 megahertz 68040 processor on a 33 megahertz bus, an official max of 36 megs of RAM, which can actually accommodate 128, the Color Classic 3 would have been a marvel of 90s engineering. Just kidding, they were literally just gonna take the motherboard from the LC575 and shove it into the back of this thing again because it was also pin compatible. They just decided to only release the LC575 instead. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Before we can even think of building a Mystic, we need to go over this Color Classic, clean it up a little bit, and make a few fixes. And then I wanna play some games and run a couple benchmarks so we can see just what kind of a dramatic improvement that Mystic upgrade is gonna make. Just like the sponsor of today's video, NordVPN can make it a dramatic improvement in your online privacy. We talk a lot about these simpler times here, back when the internet felt new, exciting, and honestly, not very scary. But the truth is, the web was totally still a dangerous place back then. That's why your parents told you to never give strangers on the internet your real name. <laughs> Ship kind of sailed there, sorry mom. The difference today is that we have a lot of tools that can help us stay safe and private on the internet. Case in point, NordVPN. When you're browsing the web without a VPN, there's a ton of ways people can weasel their way into your bits and bytes. NordVPN creates a safe tunnel that you can use, shielding you from prying eyes with next-gen encryption. Their double VPN feature encrypts traffic twice, they have diskless and co-located servers to further shield your private data. So visit nordvpn.com slash actionretro today for a special deal on NordVPN access. Details in the description below. You'll be really helping to support the channel. Okay, let's boot this thing up, which is <laughs> kind of a painful experience. I flipped the switch on the power supply in the back, but this also needs soft power to turn on. So we have to hit our power button here. And boy, that hard drive sounds pretty awful. All right, so we're about three minutes into the boot and you might think, well, okay, we've got a desktop here, but nope, nothing is responsive yet. <laughs> no window drag, it's not frozen. The hard drive's still making noise. Oh, there goes the control strip. <laughs> oh, now we've got some window. Oh man, this is absolutely painful. Okay, so we're finally in the desktop here, but things aren't great. I mean, there's a lot of cruft that loads on this install here, which is Mac OS 7.5.5. We have our 10 megs of memory, but yeah, it is dog slow. There is a noticeable delay for when you hit the mouse <laughs> and hold it down to when the menu actually opens. Just listen to the click here. It's like a, a second or so before it actually opens. Ah, oh, it's terrible. It's so bad. Now, probably a fresh install of macOS 7 point something will make this feel a lot better. And, and that's exactly what we're gonna do. But I think we should also swap out this hard drive for something solid state like a SCSI to SD with an SD card, although I actually wanna put a blue SCSI in this thing, but that'll be its own video. Yeah, this hard drive is not original to the system. I think it's like a couple hundred megabytes instead of the max 160 that we had before. But eh, it does not sound good. So the Color Classic is actually reasonably easy to get into. We'll just have to flip it down on its front. And to keep it safe, we'll use this nice VCF 2020 t-shirt. Back panel comes off. Uh, no idea where the two screws are, but it does clip into place. And then we don't actually have to take the motherboard out yet. 
there's just four Torx T15 screws here in the corners. And it's much easier than older compact Macs because you don't need a super long screwdriver to get at them. Then the back just slides right up and off. Ooh, that's a little grimy in there. Yeah, gross. Gross. What did this thing run on gasoline or something? Good Lord. Okay, so getting into this thing was pretty easy, but getting it apart is kind of really annoying. In order to get to the hard drive, we've got to go all the way in here and take out the analog board, which requires disconnecting a ton of wires here. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about exactly what to disconnect. If you're doing this yourself, I'll put a link here to a video by Brankus Creations, which he goes through detailed step-by-step -step of everything you have to take apart in order to get into this machine. Okay, so now we can see here's the hard drive. Oops. This nifty thing is the speaker in a nice little resonance chamber velcroed in there. Here's the floppy drive and the motherboard just slides right out. Although you can also take this out when the machine is still together just by removing that thing on the back. So I'm just gonna go ahead and take out the hard drive. Being very careful with this plastic caddy because that's the only thing that holds it in. It just snaps into place. And this plastic is pretty brittle. And for now, I'm just gonna stick in a SCSI to SD with a 16 gigabyte SD card. Although, again, I'm gonna put a blue SCSI in here. I've been meaning to play with one and they're, they're very cool. And I have one on order, so that'll be its own video. Okay, so I have all the internal components back together. The SCSI to SD is installed, and I brought out this lovely Apple SCSI CD-ROM drive, very generously donated to the channel by Ron of Ron's Computer Videos, an excellent channel that you should check out, link in the description below. Now, one issue that you might have noticed, because it's pretty glaring, is that the screen geometry is a little bit wonky. Thankfully, we can adjust that with a couple little knobs on the back of the machine, and there's a great video by JDW where he goes through exactly how to do it, and he does it on his own Color Classic. It's pretty easy to do, but it's also kind of dangerous because you have to do it while the screen is on. So I'm gonna do that now and see if we can't just straighten this image up a little bit. Okay, so that's as good as I was able to get it. Really not that much better. It seems like some of the adjustment knobs on the analog board are actually missing inside of the little adjustment holes. So we'll probably have to take the analog board apart and take the shield off so I can see if those little knob things actually fell off or something. But before I do that, which I'll probably do off camera, Let's install Mac OS on this thing and run some software and take some benchmarks. Well, I have made what the kids would call a big stupid. And I would like to show you my big stupid, embarrassing as it is, in case you run into a similar situation, you can stop it before it becomes a huge problem, like in my case, almost killing this machine completely. So, Coming off of the board on the back of the CRT are a number of wires that go to various places on the analog board, including this green one with a big metal kind of flat bit on the end. And you might wonder, where does this go? Where did I take this off from? Because I didn't really remember. And I'll tell you where it doesn't go. It doesn't go inside the analog board here 
shorting out components, but that's where I found it because when I tried to turn this machine back on, it just made a boop noise and then immediately shut off. So this is a ground wire and it goes kind of hooked on to this metal retaining kind of strap here. This is for ground. Make sure you reattach this strap because I did not make sure of that and it almost had dire consequences. And jump cut. I have put the Color Classic back together. It is miraculously still alive despite my previous big stupid. And I've installed System 753 Revision 2 on it. Originally, I wanted to do it with Ron's amazing CD-ROM drive here, but it just did not seem to want to boot off of the CDs that I have. So I pulled out our old friend, Raskuzzy. If you have no idea what a Raskuzzy is, I'd encourage you to check out this video here because it's an amazing piece of modern tech that gives you a web interface to basically upload disk images to a Raspberry Pi and mount them into your Mac. And uh, I have this lovely Snow White style case here designed by Potato Fi. And uh, it even has a little blinky light on the front. It's an amazing piece of kit. Anyway, it's allowed me to not only get a system installed on the SD card, but also move over a bunch of software that we can play around with. So Mac HD here is a hard drive that I've loaded onto our lovely Raskuzzy here. And I've popped a bunch of these games and uh, some old benchmarks and applications and stuff to our SD card so that we can play around. And then, uh, yeah, let's first take some quick benchmarks with MacBench 4.0. And I have this just a CPU benchmark. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, I guess, um, hmm. Can't even load MacBench 4. All right, guess we'll have to find an older version of MacBench. Okay, so I'll figure out a different benchmark app that we can use before we do the Mystic upgrade, but we both know there's a more important benchmark that we need to take a look at. Games. At least, whatever games will actually run <laughs> on this horrible screen resolution. So of course, the most important game to me is Wolfenstein 3D, which I have conveniently installed right here. Okay, it is starting, but uh, wow, that's a bit of a slideshow in those fades here. Yeah, let, let's see what our color depth is set to. Too fifty-six. Let's go sixteen. <laughs> Not really any improvement. It's still a slideshow from one fade to the other. <laughs> uh, is this even going to launch? At least, is, is this even going to get us into the game? Well, so far so good. It's within the correct resolution. It sounds great. All right, get psyched. Turn the screen brightness up here. All right, still on get psyched. Now this is starting to not look very good. Hello, I wanna play Wolfenstein. Hey. <laughs> Ah, uh, look at that tiny, tiny Wolfenstein. Hey, it works. All right. We're playing tiny Wolfenstein on a tiny screen. <laughs> that slow door opening. Oh. Yeah, it's borderline unplayable. What resolution is the game at screen size. Yeah, smallest possible screen size, but look, 512 by 384. 
We can make it nice and big and fill up this uh, color classic screen. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I mean, if this was fast, this would probably be the coolest way to play Wolfenstein. Oh no. I can see the screen like updating from top to bottom as it redraws each frame of the of the picture. Maybe some nice SimCity 2000. This should be fine, right? SimCity doesn't care how big the screen is. Yeah, I mean, it cuts off most of the loading screen here. Well, the music is slowing down as it's loading the object set. <laughs> We're fighting dual battles of screen resolution too small and processor way too slow. All right, let's load a saved city. Let's load NYC. All right, I mean, it's not the worst. Oh, no, it's the worst. Oh, it takes about two seconds after each click to move the map around. Dare I try to zoom in? <laughs> no, I take it back, this is terrible. I guess it wouldn't be impossible to play when I was a kid, I used to play SimCity 2000 on Super Nintendo. So <laughs> this is definitely a step up from that, at least. Okay, so that'll do it for this first tinkering with this lovely little color classic. And uh, I can certainly see why people love this machine. Maybe not the machine, but the idea of this machine. It's a beautiful form factor. The screen is gorgeous, if small, but that's kind of one of the things people really like about it. Not so good as we've seen are the internals, but like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, this is a big project that I've been dreaming of doing for many, many years. We're gonna stick a much, much more powerful motherboard into the back of this thing and turn it into a tiny powerhouse. And uh, I think we can actually make it much more powerful than a normal Mystic is. If you've been around the channel for a while, you might have an idea of how we're gonna do that. And you might notice that this screen still doesn't look great. It's definitely missing some of the knobs that you adjust the CRT geometry with. So I'm gonna take this thing back apart. I'm going to recap the motherboard because that also might help with the geometry. And uh, yeah, see if I can't replace some of those, some of those missing knobs. But if you like this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more Marchintosh shenanigans like this, please subscribe down below and make sure you check out the Marchintosh links while you're at it. And thank you very much for watching. And a special thanks to Camilla Noseda, Chris Allegretto, Chris Calderon, Chris Nelson, that's a lot of Chris's, David Teglovix, Greg Hrutke from Hrutke Mods, John Malman, Nick Hamsey, who are my highest tiered patrons, and all of my Patreon supporters for helping to make these videos possible.